Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah, I'm telling it to the top. Yeah. 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 Oh, okay. Up here, I know. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. Well, uh, you're almost uh, <laughs> I don't know if that's a good idea. Yeah, Before I give conference presentation. Oh, you were wondering why. And, and you can blame it on the director. <laughs> Yeah. 
I don't I don't know how I have no Yeah, friendly. Another <laughs> <laughs> question. Okay. 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 Folks online, hear me okay? So I thought it was. Yeah. 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 
I'm going to leave it like that. <laughs> What is the need to single 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 top? Okay, good. So, we'll make the introduction be compressed so we can get to the top and take another few minutes. It's really my pleasure to. Uh, Happy, uh, it says the um, it says the sound, and just let, let us know. So he uh, comes to us today from the Information Sciences Institute, uh, which is affiliated with USC in Southern California. Research interests span classical and quantum optics, communication, as he did his PhD long ago with uh, Professor Mark Baco and ECE, uh, working on things that were a little bit different than what he's been talking about. Since. Started talking three or four years ago about having a for a colloquium and plans kept getting disrupted. Here is his talk. So Thank you very much. Um, I have a, a vivid memory of the first talk that I ever gave at U of R. I was a first year PhD student. I can't quite remember. I think it was in Wilmot. And it was terrifying. Because Joe Eberly was in the front row of the top. <laughs> uh, I hope it isn't quite as bad, but it is nice to see you and, and have you here. All right, so uh, today I'm going to talk about um, something that I've been spending the last five years working on. And uh, the actual, the technical content, the technical results that I'm going to present are, um, you know, I've chosen carefully because the problem that we evaluated uh, in this work is really very simple. Um, but I really like it because it shows the, the real depth um, of quantum mechanics for even the simplest of physical problems. So I'm really excited to share with you uh, some of the results we have. But Almost more importantly, I'm excited to talk about how much I think can be learned about quantum mechanics at an intuitive level from very physical, uh, very simple physical systems. So thank you so much for having me uh, today. Okay, so I want to first uh, talk about uh, a little bit about where I am. So I live and work in Boston, Massachusetts but I uh, am employed by the University of Southern California. So USC, just like U of R, is uh, a big institution. You've probably heard of our football team. Um, and we're broken down into different colleges and schools, the medical school, dental school, and I'm in the Viterbi School of Engineering. Um, and in, that, in this Viterbi School, there are a whole bunch of departments, and I have appointments in the uh, Ming Shea Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering, 
and then also in the Information Sciences Institute. Uh, the Information Science in Institute, ISI, is a big research uh, department. So we don't actually grant degrees in ISI. We only focus on research. And we have uh, three locations. And this is where we get to Boston. So the headquarters is in Marina del Rey uh, in Los Angeles, and it overlooks the Pacific. It's magnificent. And then we have an office in Arlington, Virginia, um, right outside DC. And then uh, the newest office, which is five years old, is the Boston office, which is where I work. So uh, ISI is celebrating uh, our 50th anniversary this year. Um, and so we've been celebrating that and had a big hullabaloo in Los Angeles. Um, so it's a big celebration. At ISI, we do um, very interdisciplinary, very large research projects. And so we do some basic research projects from places like NSF, NIH, very fundamental research, all the way up through very applied research. Um, and we uh, are located off campus so that we can actually carry that research into doing um, classified research and things like prototype development for a wide diversity of sponsors in the, um, in the defense department, the intelligence community, um, all types of different organizations. We do computer science research, we do math, engineering, and we also have a quantum information group. And uh, I lead the experimental arm of the quantum information group in Boston. All right, and this is my lab in Boston. It's the Laboratory for Quantum Limited Information. And so we have, um, this is an older picture. We have three optical tables running uh, experiments at uh, three different wavelength ranges. And um, we have lots of opportunities for undergraduate researchers, graduate uh, graduates and postdocs to come in and work and on, and on, like Nick said, a, a variety of, uh, of different uh, projects and different disciplines. Um, one of my favorite pictures here is, um, so these are two students in the lower left here from Wellesley College, and the youngest student is my daughter. So um, <laughs> come into the lab. Okay. So we have opportunities. We, uh, we have graduate school, so I don't mean to recruit away from U of R, but um, uh, USC is sunnier, uh, and um, there are opportunities for, for graduate school in the ECE department and all of the Turby. And you could also come do an internship in my lab, but we have a really fun summer program there, and um, I think everybody has a lot of fun. All right, so the pillars of quantum information science. I think I'm gonna go a little quick through this um, since I'm just running a little bit behind. And so if you take the field of quantum information science, you can break it down very coarsely into three different divisions. One is quantum computing. This is probably the one you've read the most about in popular science or, or wherever. And this is using the non-classical properties of particles in order to gain computing advantage. Um, quantum communications, similar, where you use the non-classical properties of particles. In many cases, uh, in quantum communications, you use the non-classical properties of uh, photons of light in order to uh, exchange information. And a lot of the applications in quantum communications are for um, information security applications, quantum key distribution, direct secure communications, things like that. And then uh, quantum sensing is where I'm gonna spend uh, the bulk of my discussion. And a lot of times we think about quantum sensing in terms of either field sensing or time sensing by making measurements of something using a non-classical device like a spin or uh, a squid magnetometer or something like this, something that operates based on the principles of quantum mechanics. And so uh, the, the uh, types of quantum sensing that I do are a little bit different. We actually, um, we make measurements on not only non-classical states, but on classical states and talk about how we can get a quantum advantage. So in quantum sensing, there are these you know, historic limits on how well you can do, I should say with classical uh, sensing, historic limits on how well you can do to measure a quantity. 
And a lot of people have, you know, made measurements on weaker and weaker signals until you get to a point where your measurement tools fail. And then you sort of throw up your arms and say, well, there's not much more we can do. So I love the example of the telescope. Right, so if you want better resolution out of your telescope, what do you do? Well, you start a huge program in making lenses that are meters large, uh, and then you make focal plane arrays where you can cut down the noise and uh, make finer and finer pitch uh, pixels. And what this does is it gets you closer and closer and closer to a classical limit for sensitivity. And traditionally, well, that's what we've done. We've just tried to get closer and closer and closer to a classical limit on sensitivity. And so how do we quantify uh, this limit to sensitivity? Well, we talk about measurement and the precision of those measurements. Okay, so um, I actually, I can't stand this slide because I don't like blood, but I always use blood as the example of something you wanna measure. Everybody seems to wanna be measuring um, things in biomedical application. So let's say you have a little bit of blood and you wanna measure something about that blood, glucose levels or whatever doctors like to measure. Okay, so that blood could be illuminated and emit a little bit of light, some photons of light. And those photons are carrying information about whatever parameter you wanna measure in the, in the blood. Okay, and so I presume that doctors use a microscope. So the light goes into the microscope, gets focused, and gets measured on a focal plane array. Some sort of spatial or spectral uh, measurement. And so you make a bunch of those measurements and you get some signal out, right? And then you take that signal and perhaps make a plot of those signals as a function of some parameter. Right. And so for each data point, you compute a mean for the data that you've, you've acquired. And that tells you where you should put your data point on the plot. And then, you know, if you're taking a lab at UOR, the professor always makes you put error bars on things, unfortunately. And so you might compute your variance of that data and get yourself an error bar to put on that data. Now, those error bars often seem like, you know, an exercise in, you know, mundanity. You know, very hard to compute a pain, you draw it on there. But I'll tell you this, if you're an astronomer and you're mapping an asteroid that's far away and headed towards the Earth, those error bars are pretty damn important. So you better learn how to calculate them and you better get them right and you better make them as small as you possibly can by making the best measurement you possibly can. And when your light is very weak, you start with a poor approximation to the state of your light if you're using Maxwell's equations. Because very weak light can only be properly represented using a full, quantum treatment. And so with a complete quantum treatment of that light that's coming into your receiver, we can understand what the fundamental limit is to our precision for making these measurements. Okay. And what's really beautiful here is that the, um, that precision is not only computable, and it's oftentimes not that hard to compute, but it's achievable. So we know that we can build a measurement apparatus to achieve that precision in the measurement. We know it can be done, but oftentimes we don't actually know what that measurement device looks like. It takes, uh, it takes some imagination. Okay, and so the way we represent things in quantum mechanics, um, at least in, in my work, it's using the quantum density matrix. And the quantum density matrix is, um, at least for a pure state, it's just the outer product of your ket vectors. So if you, have a, if you have a pure state, it's just a ket vector, you take the outer product, you get the density matrix. Okay. And the 
density matrix for a laser uh, can be written, I should say the, um, you have a, st a yardstick there, right? Or, uh, it's okay, I'm pretty tall. Um, the, uh, the pure state for a laser can be written in that ket vector up top there, alpha equals that expression. And so the density matrix is just the outer product of uh, that ket vector. And so you get the density matrix here and the diagonal elements of that density matrix tell you what the populations are. How much, I'm writing this in the Fock basis, how much population is in each photon number state in this density matrix. And the off diagonal elements of this matrix are called coherences. And those elements tell you what the purity of your state is. So if you have a full, thank you. <laughs> Which is the button, that one? Oh, thanks. So what we can do here is we can look at this density matrix. And we can look at the magnitude of these off diagonal elements and figure out how close is this to a quantum mechanical pure state? And if these go, these terms go to zero, then you have a, a fully mixed state, what a lot of people would call a classical state. And so what we wanna do is going back to our sensing application, we want to represent that input quantum state, not using Maxwell's equations, but instead using the full quantum mechanical uh, density matrix treatment. Okay. So in my group, we ask and we sometimes answer three questions. What is it that we actually want to know from a state that's coming into our receiver? Like a lot of times, um, and, and I'm guilty of this too, Right, I'll take my cell phone out to take a picture of something like to remember a phone number. That's an awful lot that I'm capturing just so I can record seven numbers, right? So in any given measurement process, it's often a waste to record all this information when you really only wanna know one number or one parameter. So we carefully ask the question, what do we wanna know about the subject or source that's emitting the signal? And then we want to ask how much information, that's in caps, by the way, so this won't be the last time you see it, is available in the quantum state for us to measure. How much information is there to actually learn about the signal that's coming in and the target that emitted it? And then finally, once we compute how much information is available, the last question is, okay, how do we build a measurement apparatus to actually extrude all that information out of that very delicate state that came into our receiver. So these are the three questions that we ask and we try to answer. And I'm gonna give you an example of uh, one today. Okay. Let's see here. Okay. So what's happening here is we have our blood again, right? And it's emitting a few photons and it's going into the microscope. And the process here is that we're taking these photons and we're expressing them as a density matrix, as a full density matrix. And what's happening here is this is uh, the universal sign for a quantum measurement. What's happening here is if you make this measurement on that density matrix that's coming into the receiver. Just, just watch the uh, density matrix. What happens is you lose, if you make the wrong measurement, you lose a huge chunk of the information that's in that density matrix. And you all know from quantum mechanics, once it's gone, it's gone. It's not coming back. And so what we've done is by not being careful about making this measurement on the state coming in, we've really wasted a whole chunk of the information that's available in that state. So it's incumbent upon us to be much more careful about the measurement we make on that state in order to extract all the information that's possible 
uh, to extract there. And so what you've done is you've taken that really nice interference pattern, show the Wigner function there. And what you get out is this sort of delta function in the plane. So you've lost all that information. And so oftentimes if you're making measurements and your signal is bright, don't worry about quantum mechanics. Classical is pretty good. And you know, you don't need to, you don't need to build a new microscope, you don't need to build a new telescope. You're you're fine. The next regime, when the power starts to get lower and lower, is really the semi-classical uh, regime where you have a low energy approximation. And in this case, you should pick whatever representation is uh, best suited for you, but you have to account for the particle nature of light. So you're going to see this semi-classical um, nature of light. And really, when you get down into a photon starred regime, you can use a full, you really need to use a full de de quantum density matrix approach in order to understand how to build a receiver to get any information at all uh, out of the signal that's coming into your receiver. And so, what does a classical receiver chain look like? So, I'm, I'm not really the classical signal processing person, but um, a lot of times what you do here is you have some light coming into your receiver, right? And we use like a wave equation to model that light. And the information might be carried in the frequency or the uh, time dependent amplitude of the signal coming in. And then we do direct detection. We measure that signal using some photodiode or something like that. And we get a current out. And then probably you want to digitize that current. So it goes through an A to B converter. And then we take those bits and do some signal, uh, signal uh, digital signal processing on it. And we get an estimate of theta, our parameter of interest. And we also should compute a variance uh, on, the, on that estimate. So you can see really a perfect quantum analog to this. And that is, let's not use a wave equation anymore. Let's use a quantum density matrix approach here. And let's take this quantum density matrix and put it into a qubit register, just like you took this analog signal here and put it into a digital register. And take those qubits and pass them through a quantum processor and then make a final measurement on the uh, state that comes through your quantum processor. And you'll see that this whole thing is really a general purpose quantum computer. And out the other side of this thing, you will get a quantum limited es uh, uh, estimate of your parameter of interest, and you will get a variance on that measurement that's at the quantum limit of precision. So really, we just need to build all the pieces that are quantum analog to the uh, classical analogs that currently exist. It's really hard, so I, I don't mean to sound, uh, make it sound uh, very easy. But, um, but all these pieces are under development. So in different parts of the world, people are working on, on building these things. Okay. So, Information is like all around us and it's encoded on physical signals, right? So these are my daughters and they don't like to talk to each other very much, right? So when they want to send a message to each other, they will have something to say, turn it into some bits, encode that information on an electromagnetic wave that comes through some, let's see. I don't think I'll take a call from FedEx right now. Um, encode that on uh, electromagnetic fields, send it uh, over to Alex. She will receive it on her iPad or whatever it is, and then um, decode the message. And so the point is, is that they're taking information and they're encoding it on physical things. They're encoding it on electromagnetic waves, or they're encoding it on light or smoke signals, something physical. 
Mm. No. Okay. And so I don't want to dis besmudge the, uh, the godfather of our field here, but Claude Shannon is the father of information theory. And he really made and quantified a deep connection between physical signals and information. So there's, there's one thing I want to point out here, though, is that he invented the bit. And the bit helps to be an abstraction of information theory from physical signals. So now computer scientists can really think about bits. And they don't really need to think about electromagnetism and photons and things like that, which is, which is great. Um, but it is somehow abstracted our thinking away from information from, from physics. And so I think we're, we're at a real precipice in quantum information because now we're talking about qubits. And qubits can be abstracted away from physical systems so that computer scientists and, and folks like that can really think about how, how to engineer quantum computers. And I, I worry that, you know, I spent so much time thinking about the physics that goes into a qubit to have that really lost, I think would be, would be a shame. And so connecting physical uh, signals and information is really important to me. And you're doing this all the time, right? We have targets that emit light that goes into your eye and you get a signal. And the longer you integrate, better variance you can get on that signal. And so we have this analog world around us all the time. And um, really, the connection here is conditional probabilities are derived from these physical signals. And so we can connect these, uh, we can connect information. How much information do we have about a target? We can connect that directly to these conditional probabilities. Um, about a target. And Bayes' theorem is used in classical probabilities to figure out how much information do we have about classical variables. And there are really some, let's get to this. There are really some uh, beautiful analogs between classical information theory and quantum information theory, and that's what I want to point out next. How many people have seen the movie Moneyball? Everyone? Not everyone. Okay. So there's this awesome scene in Moneyball. Anyway, this, this story is about the Oakland A's, and they didn't have as much money as like the Boston Red Sox. And they wanted to figure out how can they win the World Series, even if they can't afford the very best players in the world. So there's this great scene in the movie where uh, Jonah Hill uh, is talking to Brad Pitt. And he says, the Red Sox look at Johnny Damon, who was a great player at the time. The Red Sox look at Johnny Damon, and they see a star worth $7.5 million a year. When I look at Johnny Damon, I see an imperfect understanding of where runs come from. And when I saw this, I like jumped up off the couch, and I said, that's it. Because when people want to build a better camera, what do they do? They build a bigger aperture. They build a focal point array with finer pitch. They reduce the dark noise. They never stop to think, maybe we should represent that incoming signal with a full quantum density matrix. Maybe we should compute the quantum Fisher information for how much information can be extracted out of this scene, and then go back to the drawing board and redesign how we rethink a telescope. So, maybe a little grandiose, but I like to think that's what we're doing in our lab, is looking at sensing scenarios and going back to full print, uh, first principles and starting there and reevaluating everything with a quantum mechanical approach. So there's this, theory, there's this book, it's out of print. Uh, it's really the Bible in our field, uh, Quantum Detection and Estimation Theory by Carl Hellstrom. It's gotta be in the Rush Reed stacks or something, so. Um, See if you can go find it. If not, I have a pirated copy. So. Oh. Okay. 
So we go to our next two questions. How much information is available and how do we build an apparatus? Okay, so we need a few pieces here in order to build an apparatus for measurement at the quantum limit. We need a full quantum model. We need a quantum measurement. And then we need an estimator to use the results of that measurement to get our estimate at the quantum limit of variance. And the way we're gonna do this is we're gonna build a quantum measurement using uh, a unitary operation on the quantum state that's coming in, followed by photon number resolving detection on the state uh, that comes out of the unitary. Okay. All right, so the Hellstrom bound. So this is the first information theoretic quantity that I wanna talk about. And it's got a, a direct analog to Bayes' theorem. And so let's pretend you have two possible states that are coming, coming into your receiver. How do you optimally discriminate which state is coming into your receiver where the two states are equiprobable at the beginning? And the way we do it is by computing the Hellstrom bound. The author of that book I showed you two slides ago is Carl Hellstrom. He came up with the Hellstrom bound. And you'll see that the minimum error probability limited only by the laws of quantum mechanics is a function of the density matrices for those two candidate states that are coming into your receiver. And that's it. So this is a pretty darn simple quantity to compute. So now I get to our physical example. Let's pretend that you are a spaceship out in space and you see just a absolute trickle of light coming in, maybe a photon. The question then becomes, how do you discriminate at the quantum limit whether that light came from just noise, like some star or something, you know, some radiating thing in space? or whether it came from a laser. So this could be an interesting question, right? Because if you're looking into deep space and you see some laser light, something's going on out there, right? Probably a good bet there's some intelligent civilization that knows quantum mechanics well enough to build a laser. Um, there are other reasons why you'd want to discriminate these two states of light, but that to me is the most interesting one. Okay, and so what we do just like, you know, Carl Hellstrom told us, is we write down the quantum density matrices for those two different types of light. So we can write the coherent state and we can write the thermal state. And then we compute the Hellstrom bound. So what we see here, I'm gonna click through this. Okay. What we is that if we were to just use a regular <clears throat> old photodiode or um, you know, photon counting detector, this magenta line here is our discrimination error probability. That's how well we could discriminate these two types of light as a function of the number of, of the mean photon number coming into our receiver. This black line at the bottom here is the fundamental quantum limit. This is what Carl Hellstrom tells us is the best we could ever do. But what Carl Hellstrom doesn't tell us is how to do it. That's up to us. And it turns out there's, there's kind of a neat, um, uh, there's kind of a neat procedure that I haven't really figured out yet, but you take that matrix, which is the difference between those two states and you compute the eigenvectors and those eigenvectors are supposed to tell you what the measurement operator is. But, um, I haven't really figured out how to do that yet. So um, this black line is the uh, quantum limit. And what we did is we looked at some old results on communications receivers for photon star communications links. And we found a receiver called the generalized Kennedy receiver. And when you use it for this discrimination problem, you can get to really, really close to the Hellstrom bound. It's really important that you see we didn't hit it. Uh, that will come up later, but we got really, really close. Okay, so 
we actually know what the quantum limit is and we know what a structured receiver is now to get darn close to the Hellstrom bound. So we built it. It's actually not that simple, but uh, uh, sorry, it's not that hard. It's pretty simple. And so what we can do is uh, generate what's called a uh, coherent nulling receiver. And um, I was talking with Professor Cardenas actually earlier. It's actually relatively similar to the, the weak value amplification that we were talking about. And then you do, so I promised you we would have a unitary operation followed by number resolving detectors. And then we would have an estimator at the end. So this is a structure that, that I pointed out earlier. And so we did, the demo, we did the experiment using photon number resolving detection and we showed that, yeah, it hits right about on what on the information theory, theoretic line you'd expect for photon counting. And then we implemented another receiver called the Kennedy receiver, which isn't quite as flexible as the GK, but then um, we did the experiment for the generalized Kennedy receiver, and we showed that you could get pretty darn close, actually right on top of that, that GK line. So we hit it. And uh, we presented this work in Optics Express. Uh, but one thing I'd like to point out is that um, uh, Phoebe Amory took a lot of this data. She was an undergrad at Wellesley College. So she really got in there and um, showed her how to take data and she took some outstanding data and um, participated in the publication. Okay, there's one more bound, 15 minutes, plenty of time. The quantum turnoff bound. In the previous work, I talked about what happens if you have one state coming into your receiver. How do you make the best measurement possible? And computed the Hellstrom bound, found a receiver. Now, I'm in another question. What happens if rather than one state, I give you as many copies of that one state as you want? So these states, copies are just flooding into your receiver. The question then becomes, how do you minimize, how quickly can you minimize your error probability by making measurements on this long string of copies that are coming into your receiver? Okay, so there is, of course, a classical Chernoff bound, and we make, we, we uh, achieve the class, we can compute the classical Chernoff bound by uh, taking these copies and making classical measurements on them as they come in and then looking at the Bayes uh, statistics. Um, but we are interested in the quantum turnoff bound. And the quantum turnoff bound was actually not, uh, found not that long ago, just in 2007, it was derived here. And in fact, there was a paper uh, a few years earlier than that, in 2005, in the Journal of Statistics, Statistical Physics or something like that, and he had it. This guy had the quantum Chernoff bound, but he didn't quite finish the proof. And so uh, in the paper for this, we, we referenced that guy's work, but he actually inspired uh, me to pursue this problem because he presented it so elegantly. But uh, this is the paper that, where the, the full proof was pre presented. And so the quantum Chernoff bound says, if you have an, uh, if you have an error probability, it's bounded to be less than or equal to the exponent of M being the number of copies you measure multiplied by CQ, QCB. This is the, um, the Chernoff error uh, exponent, quantum Chernoff exponent. And uh, the quantum Chernoff exponent can be computed like that. And you'll notice, again, all it took was knowing what these two density matrices are for the states you're trying to discriminate in order to compute the, uh, the uh, quantum Chernoff bound. So not that, not that hard. Okay. And so what we did is we set up the experiment similar to the one we did previously. And then we measured the discrimination error probability as a function of T, really the number of copies of these states that we're sending into our receiver. We did this for, again, for direct detection. And you can see the Chernoff exponent for direct detection is way down here. And there's a huge gap between the Chernoff error exponent and the quantum Chernoff bound, which is the blue line here. 
and you'll see that the quantum Chernoff bound is achieved with the Kennedy receiver. And you probably don't remember from the previous slide, but this Kennedy receiver, which wasn't optimal for the single measurement case, is optimal when you have a lot of copies. Well, that's, that's strange, right? And so I was talking to a buddy of mine from the University of Arizona, actually University of Arizona College of Optical Sciences. And he said, oh, my student and I have been working on a proof to show that the receiver that achieves the Hellstrom bound is a factor of at least two worse in error exponent than the receiver that achieves the quantum Chernoff bound. So that's kind of non-intuitive. And so what we did, this is the paper on the, on the QCB, but we went back and we did this measurement with the generalized Kennedy receiver. And we showed that indeed there was a large gap there. Now, what you'll see here is that this, this dashed line is the line, the error exponent, uh, the error exponent that can be achieved with the Hellstrom receiver. And you'll see that it's worse than the receiver we used in the previous single copy case. And I asked you to remember this, but you'll no note that our receiver didn't quite hit that Hellstrom bound. And so it's actually a little bit better in the multi-copy case than the receiver that would actually hit the Hellstrom bound. So this is kind of weird, right? And it turns out that there is a nice analog here between making a soft decision and a hard decision in communication theory. And so you can build a more optimal receiver sometimes when you, make, when you build a receiver that makes a soft decision. And that's actually what the Kennedy receiver here does. And it makes this soft decision, uh, again, similar to the weak value measurement by nulling that hypothesis that's coming into the receiver. Um, yeah, so I think this is really interesting work and it's also spurred us to think a lot about uh, how to build an adaptive receiver that you could somehow take a knob and tune between being optimal for single shot versus being uh, optimal for, for multi-shot. Okay, so what's next? I'm, I've got 10 minutes left, but I wanted to leave a little time for um, questions. And so we're thinking about what do we do next with this work? And so, you know, one thing we've learned here is that discriminating quantum states when they're photon starved is, is pretty hard, right? Well, maybe we should use that for our advantage. And so a few years ago, uh, some friends and I wrote a paper about um, the fundamental quantum limit to doing covert communications. So covert communications is being able to communicate between two points without anyone else knowing that communications is even happening. Okay. And so we did this just using laser light and direct detection uh, and some fancy coding from real information theorists, uh, Saikot and Bula. Um, one of my colleagues at USC named Todd Bruin has come up with some protocols about how to do quantum steganography, basically how to hide data communications in noise, in noisy backgrounds. And so leveraging the work that I talked about today, we're thinking about how do we build quantum communication systems that can achieve covertness using the fact that it's super hard to discriminate between these quantum states. And so one of the things that Haley is working on right now is imagine that you had two mode squeeze vacuum. So you had an entangled state. If you trace out one of the modes of that two, two mode squeeze vacuum and then make measurements on that remaining mode, it just looks like thermal light. All you get is a thermal state. And so if you put one of them through the channel 
an eavesdropper is going to have a really hard time figuring out whether I'm looking at a thermal state from noise or a thermal state, which is one half of an entangled state, the twin of which is somewhere else in this channel. And so we're working on actually uh, implementing this now and showing that it is information uh, theoretically provably covert uh, and can achieve positive rate communications, which um, I'm not advertising it, but if you look at this paper, uh, you'll see that um, the limit for covertness is actually zero rate, which doesn't sound that great, but <laughs> what it means is you can send a finite chunk of bits provably covertly, but we don't want to do that. We want a nice, fast communications channel. So how do we become provably covert and get non-zero rate uh, communications? Another uh, interesting piece of work is from uh, a student who was at Wellesley College, um, and she is now a first year at the University of New Mexico. And she was looking at this. Imagine, and I don't have it all diagrammed out. I thought it was running over on slides. But imagine that you have a quantum key distribution channel and you're sending coherent states, photon star coherent states through that quantum key distribution channel. One of the big problems with QKD is if you couple in noise, thermal noise, you have to assume that the errors you get at your measurement are from an eavesdropper. And so you've got to throw, throw those bits out, fortunately. But what Piper is working on is understanding how to build a really complex measurement so that you could disambiguate thermal noise that just leaks into your channel from the sun or room lights or something like that, disambiguate that from a malicious eavesdropper in the channel that's making weak measurements on that state. Both of them take a, take a pure state and they uh, make it into a mixed state. But uh, if you look carefully, if you inspect those density matrices carefully, you'll see several differences. How do we make measurements on those density matrices so that we can extract the most information to try to disambiguate you know, a bad guy from uh, just thermal noise that's in our channel? And so, um, you know, these are a couple of examples of the way we can um, couple information theory to real physical systems. And um, at the end of my talk, I'd be glad to try to answer any questions. Thanks, Bob. Uh, except for a brief mention at the beginning of your talks, you didn't bring fish information I know. this discussion. How would one uh, bring fish information to Okay, so good question. I have some other results. And the problem is I was looking at the number of slides. I was like, I got to make a hard decision here. That was a pun. And get rid of something. So I threw out the work we had done where we took a beam splitter. And let's pretend the beam splitter is, has a tunable transmissivity between zero and one. Coherent state's going in here, thermal state's going in here. You get a mixed state out here. How could you achieve the quantum fissure information for estimating what the transmissivity of that beam splitter is? So we did some work on that, um, but it was just going to stretch the talk for too long, but I'd be glad to, to talk about it. Uh, one thing I'll say about that is that we have not come up with a measurement that achieves the, the QFI, but the way you can do it is you can compute the symmetric logarithmic derivative, and then the eigenvectors of the SLD are supposed to give you the measurement operators that will get you to the quantum fissure information limit, but I don't know how to turn these eigenvectors. I had a student that computed the eigenvectors, used them actually to, to measure, uh, you know, on the computer, measure the QFI, achieve the QFI. We don't know how to turn those into elements on the optics table. So I think that's a really awesome project for a student, um, but we're not there yet. 
I'm just confused about something. Two slides back. It, it seemed to me you were contradicting yourself. Probably. Oh, oh, no, one for I guess it was a little. Yeah, what, what's it mean up there to distinguish practical quantum states from those that can survive lossy channels where there aren't, there aren't any such states? Oh, so I think so. I think you mean there aren't any non classical states. I don't mean there aren't any quantum states that survive lossy channels. So uh, a coherent laser state comes out the other side. It's a little weaker, but it's got basically this. Survive, man, but it didn't get me. Didn't oh, get no, no. At all. Oh, that's not. No, there, is, no, there aren't any states that don't get diminished. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Are there any uh, questions online? Maybe I should look at the chat too. Bill, so you mentioned the chart off there. You didn't mention frame around values, which are of course the first type of picture information. And, you know, I was sort of taking it back because I. I had heard mention of the turnoff bound in optics since I was an undergraduate yeah. a long time ago. Um, can, you, can you talk about the two and what they're different, what the difference is? And Between turnoff and uh, QFI or the cream around? Yeah. Okay. So the turnoff bound is really um, a limit for discriminating between a finite set of candidate hypotheses. So, um, you know, oftentimes in communications, let's say you have a, a QPSK communication symbol coming in. You wanna be able to discriminate those for the alphabet as well as possible. The quantum Fisher information tells you what your limit is to estimating a parameter, a continuous parameter. So let's say that phase were a, um, a continuous variable between, let's say, zero and pi. Your ability to estimate phase with the minimum variance, that would be the, the quantum Fisher information, which I believe is the inverse of the quantum Kramer album. In this idea of trying to extract new information from measurement, right? And then you're saying what extract and how much is there for us to get? Is this in some way related to this idea of you know um, you when you have this repetitivity in, in the data? I think it's called and when you use entropy to entropy to understand like what is the pure information that you have that is not like uh, random that is just random in your measurement. I don't know if this is related to the to the bounds that you're using. So are you talking about redundancy? I'm sorry. Redundancy. Ah, ah I see. Um and how like these you know types of measurements can help us like understand that. I guess I, I'm not quite sure. I mean I, I think that you're are you talking about redundancy in data? Right. Okay. And so so I, I think this is a pretty important point actually that you bring up. It's an awesome question because I skipped over one of the most important pieces of this whole thing. And I'm not sure if I'm gonna, it's not really rolling, rolling back very well, but um, you can make the best measurement that physics will allow. It's when you talk about the and, telescope, for example, right? yeah. you're trying to overachieve something, but at the end, probably the information that you're trying to extract. Exactly, address, so that's the like point, nothing, right? is you get measurement results out the other side. Those are just numbers. The next thing is, and I, re I rely on my theory partners for this, is you need to come up with an estimator, an optimal estimator that takes that sequence of measurements and turns it into your quantum limited estimate. And so this string of data is like a string of measurement results, but you're not quite done. You need to come up with that optimal estimator. And that's a, that's a classical processing step. Developing that estimator. And it's not trivial. I don't do it. Uh, and so, 
Yeah. Seemed like you said it would work, work fine, like, uh, I guess, extract information in the classical ways, in uh, classical states, in classical ways. But you also mentioned see, that from the quantum states, like the, the, the purity coefficients seem to also like hold information about the state that's kind of inaccessible in the classical regime. And so, in that sense, even like if you do it classically, wouldn't that mean we lose information about um, like I, you're right? Yes, you're right. Good catch. But when you have a macroscopic signal, you get so much information out of that signal, you're probably not worried about that remaining amount. And so there is this limit. Let me let me think of a good example. Actually, here's a, here's a good example. Let's pretend we have a telescope, right? And in the far field, you have two points that are below the Rayleigh limit. But let's say those points radiate a ton of light, right? Watts. So you're getting a lot of light onto your focal plane array. If you know the point spread function of your aperture really well, like perfectly, you can figure out what the separation is on those two points just by like deconvolving the uh, point spread function from your receive signal. So you can't really do that, or it's super hard to do that. If you're just getting a trickle of photons, let's say you get two, three, four photons in, really hard to, to, to deconvolve your point spread function. If you have a lot of light, you can do it. So that's an example where you can just really pound the problem rather than you know being elegant. The quantum receiver, you talked about the source, your detector, and the unit rate transformation of the detector. So with the aperture from so source to receiver. Not necessarily um, So I think what we do is we just say, like an example like that, that's just part of the loss in the system. And so we really measure ourselves about uh, against how much we get through that, you know, first inch of our aperture. Yeah, that's right. And so that's a good point is that everything I said here is we just take what nature has given us and compute these information theoretic bounds. But there's a license here in some scenarios where there's not too much loss to maybe inject some non classical states in here. Now, there are states like squeeze states that um, are very sensitive to loss. And so you better be real careful about when you spend time and energy building these squeeze states that you don't lose it all in your, your loss afterwards. But you know some of these examples of um, like the quantum illumination examples where you have you know two uh, entangled photons and you send one out and it comes back with a lot of loss and noise. So there are examples uh, out there that uh, where non-classical states help you. Um, but I think if we want to talk about practical results that we're going to be able to demonstrate to interested parties in the near term, I think this stuff is really great. <laughs> a pat on my own back. <laughs> Yeah, I think I made a mistake. I thought it was a mistake, but you don't have to build another 